Hello and welcome to another episode of Innovator Interviews on Earth 911's Sustainability in Your Ear podcast. I'm Mitch Ratcliffe. Welcome back. Uh, today we are joined by Kennery Webb, Dr. Kennery Webb, who is the founder of Health and Harmony, a, a program that has achieved remarkable results in reforestation and uh, engagement with indigenous peoples in Borneo. Uh, since 2005, when it was founded, uh, the organization has helped to reduce the number of illegal logging households, that is, homes that are making their, their living off uh, uh, poaching trees uh, in Borneo. And at the same time, while uh, helping those people move to uh, sustainable jobs, has reduced the number of, or the uh, rate of under five mortality by more than 90%. So they're making an incredible uh, impact on the ground for the people there in the region. And additionally, uh, through their conservation efforts, both direct and through their replant uh, and through just a, a protection of the land, they have restored 20,000 hectares of forest, which has started to regrow. Kennery, welcome to the show. Uh, great job. How did you get involved in this? What was the what was the catalyst for your beginning, Health and Harmony? Mitch, thank you so much for inviting me on. This is such an honor to be here. So I actually first went to Borneo when I was an undergraduate to study orangutans, and I spent a year deep in the rainforest. It was the most miraculous and incredible year, but it was also really painful because mm -hmm. the forest was disappearing around me, and I could hear the chainsaws nearly every day, and mm -hmm. I just began to hate those loggers. But then... Over time, I got to know many of those men, and I discovered that they were in an impossible situation, mm -hmm. that often they were logging just to pay for the most basic necessities of life. But the key element that really got people was health care access. Really? Yeah. One guy I know had to cut down 60 trees, giant, big rainforest trees to pay for one C-section. Because one medical emergency can cost an entire year's income. And when you make very little money, you know, there's just, there are very few options. And so one of the only ways to get um, a large amount of cash was to log, illegally log the rainforest, even when they didn't want to. Uh, that's interesting. So they felt the conflict as well. Oh, yeah. yeah. When we first started in these communities in Borneo, we did a survey and we found out that 99% of the people wanted the, to protect the forest and wanted it to be there for future generations. Hmm. But the logging was rampant. They just didn't, but they understood this horrible tension between the short-term and long-term well-being. You know, we don't give uh, the people who are living in these these regions that kind of credit. Usually, uh, it's generally seen. We only see the uh, outcome. We don't see the the impetus. And uh, you're being on the on on the ground talking with them is uh, has become an integral part of health and harmony. Now, what does health and harmony do on uh, in Borneo, uh, and how do these folks experience your service? So, when we first started working there. After I founded the nonprofit Health and Harmony, we we did what I call radical listening, which means we sat down with all with groups of community members all the way around the national park. We had over four hundred hours of listening, and we asked people, "Look, you all are guardians of this precious rainforest that is valuable to the whole world. What would you need as a gift from the world, as a thank you from the world, so that you could actually protect it?" Mm -hmm. Because we knew they wanted to protect it, they just couldn't. And you know what was amazing? We, partly we had so many hours of listening because I thought every single village was going to come to a different answer. But actually, every single community came to the same conclusion. And they said, we need access to high-quality, affordable health care, and we need training in sustainable agriculture, particularly organic farming techniques. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So, uh, a consensus. Complete consensus. So we're like, Okay, well, all right. I'm trusting everyone that they actually know what the fulcrums of change are. So we started a clinic. Eventually, we actually built a hospital. And we um, have been doing sustainable agriculture training. And as you said in the beginning, 10 years later, we have an 88% drop in logging households. We went from about 1,350 logging uh, houses down to 150 after 10 years, and we're now uh, less than 100. So, and are those are those uh, less than 100? Are they uh, 
acting sustainably now or are they still uh, uh, poaching? So those like 80 remaining logging households are still poaching. Mm -hmm. Um, But we are now, we've now, those, those last remaining guys seem to be a little bit of a different category of people. Mm -hmm. They usually, um, they're almost all chainsaw owners. So some people were borrowing chainsaws or being hired, but these guys all own their chainsaws. Hmm. And they usually started logging when they were very, very young. So they're kind of the residual folks for whom it's harder to switch. Hmm. And what we've been doing is actually buying their chainsaws. Hmm. And we call it a joint business venture. So we put in some capital startup. They put in their chainsaw as capital startup. And then we work with them to help them, actually them and their wives. So we're Mm -hmm. very insistent that (laughs) women always have to be involved. Um, to start uh, small businesses. And those have been wildly successful. So we've bought, uh, I think it's now 86 chainsaws. I, I, so you've got, you, you could do a chainsaw statue with that. or That's exactly you know, what we plan to do. You got it. Really? Good. <laughs> yes. I, I was going to suggest juggling them too, but. Uh, uh, you're way in, too heavy. <laughs> those uh, things are so heavy. It's crazy. Yeah. These are the big chainsaws. I, uh, All these enormous blades. These are right. huge trees they're cutting down. Yeah. Now uh, you're in the midst of a $20 million campaign to protect a, a 1 million hectares. Uh, yes. How's that going? Well, we are so excited because we have demonstrated that win-win solutions are possible. You know, Mm -hmm. like you, like you pointed out in the beginning, it's not only that the logging has dramatically declined and we've had 20,000 hectares of regrowth forest in um, under five mortality went down 90%. This is like true win-win. And most of uh, the community members in our area are actually making three times what they used to make. So incomes have gone up, people are healthier and happier, and the forest is protected. So we look at that and we go, my God, this has to happen everywhere. And it's these forests, it's no joke. Where we work uh, at Gunung Palang National Park, was about, which has about 100,000 hectares of forest, the amount of carbon, actually not even, I'm not even counting the 20,000 hectares of regrowth forest, just in the remaining primary forest, which right. was when we started, um, it, actually the forty percent of the forest had already been lost. So that sixty percent of the forest remaining has as much carbon in it as fourteen years of carbon emissions from San Francisco. So we we are desperate and so excited to do this in many other locations. We've already started another national park, which is one hundred and eighty thousand hectares in Borneo, and we're looking to start in Madagascar and Brazil. That's fantastic. Now, uh, and what you're describing is uh, uh, Hans Rosling showed recently, uh, prior to his unfortunate death, uh, yes. that, oh. that progress is taking place all over the world. And we tend to discount this. We tend to think of these places as, as bereft and impoverished. But what you're talking about is genuine progress in the community. That's right. How, yes. do, you, how, do, you, how, do, you, how do you convey to people the relationship between these remote rainforests and San Francisco. Uh, what's the, what is the relationship we need to understand about? Well, you know, the communities there a hundred percent get it. Even before we got there, they would describe the forests as the lungs of the earth, paru paru dunia. And they're right. Of course, as, although as a doctor, I would, I would say it's, it's slightly, it's, it's like a reverse lung, right? So <laughs> human lungs absorb oxygen and release CO2, right? Mm-hmm. The rainforests absorb CO2 and release oxygen. So they're like this beautiful symmetrical thing to what all living beings on earth need. They need the forests. And there's also all kinds of other amazing things that the forests do. They protect, uh, they they create rainfall, Mm -hmm. they keep the earth cooler. um, And then as I, you know, the the absorption of CO2 at this point is absolutely critical. So not only do we need the forest standing because they continue to absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, but if you log them quite severely, they will often burn, although mm-hmm. natural forest, rainforest will not burn because it has so much water in it. 
but really badly logged forest will. And then the amount of carbon released when it burns is just horrific. Yeah, massive. Right? Massive. Well, certainly Californians can relate to that this year. I know. Unfortunately. Oh, it's so sad. It's just when we think, you know, we have 12 years on this planet to figure it out. This is an absolute emergency. I love the name of your site, Earth 911. That is where we are. Yeah. It, uh, and what we believe is you need to make decisions every day in support of the earth. Uh, That's right. A lot of the times we simply don't have the insight into what's in the products and services that we use. So we're trying to we're hopefully trying to help with that. Yeah. Uh, you know, and conversation is so important uh, here. And you've used radical listening. Could we use radical listening uh, across the globe? Uh, yes. And particularly through your site? Uh, yes. That is exactly what we envision. So we envision getting really good data at a number of more sites and showing, look, this works in completely different context. It works, you know, quickly and dramatically. And then what we want to do is be able to actually use technology to do radical listening in communities all over the world. Because we got 12 years. we got to do this fast. Yeah, we need and to then, buddy up these communities. I know. Buddy them up with all of us all over the world. The, you know, the global citizens who, hey, we want a future, right? Mm -hmm. And that future requires that we partner with communities who also want to protect the forest. They just can't. You know, as I was reading uh, in preparation for our discussion, uh, it really strikes me that uh, that. Uh, here in the West, we think of ourselves as outside nature, and uh, and we talk about managing nature. And in fact, I think that's a perfectly reasonable description of what we do. But we think of ourselves as separate from it when we do so. And the folks that you're talking with and working with in Borneo live inside nature. They can't escape the fact that they live inside nature, and they acknowledge it in a way that we seem to have lost. How how, how 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 do you bridge that difference of perspective? Well, I mean, it's funny, things like the fires help you realize just actually how much we do live in nature all the time, whether we think of it or not. Um, but in Borneo, it's true. These communities directly and intimately understand their connection to the forest. Many people call the forest their mother. Mm -hmm. They see it as, you know, this, this life-giving source where you know, the, if, if the hills are covered in trees, there's lots of water that flows down from the hills. That water is essential for your family, but it's also essential for the rice fields that feed your family. Mm -hmm. So there's this very direct understanding that if the forest is healthy, you are healthy and doing well. And on a global scale, that's also true. And <laughs> Yeah. Bringing that to the forefront of people's minds in the West is so incredibly important right now. And what you're doing yes. is going to be a great help. Yeah. And I, I don't, I don't know. I feel like a lot of people are beginning to understand it on a, maybe even a physical level, how interconnected we are with the natural world. And that if we don't have a stable planet, we don't have a stable ecosystem we, we won't survive, you know, yeah. the very food we eat, the buildings we live in, the, you know, our, our ability to protect ourselves from disease. All of those things are, are intimately related to a healthy ecosystem. Is, a, is another component of the way that uh, the rainforest population can contribute is to, to investigate and bring in, uh, compounds that they discover in plants and uh, that could be used in medicine or, or would that encourage a kind of misuse of the forest too no i don't think that's a misuse of the forest at all i mean the the rainforest is two percent of the surface of the earth and contains 50 percent of the world species mm -hmm. i mean that's dramatic and i don't remember the numbers right now but there's if you look at modern medicine a kind of ridiculous amount of it actually came the original ideas for many of these molecules came from the natural world so and and when you go prospecting they call it prospecting yep. um for these plant medicines um you know, you often work with indigenous communities because they've been using these forests for 
millennia and and know often what's very um, useful. But you don't have to like take all of those compounds from the forest, right? You just find what compound right. works and then you can use it. You can recreate it. Right. And that's and so that, that prospecting, I mean, a lot of people forget that aspirin comes from birth. Yeah. 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 And, and, and we just, we move on and we become progressive without being reflective about that progress. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so I, you know, I, I, I'm really encouraged by uh, particularly the combination of, of modern and traditional thinking that you're you're putting together. And your site is healthinharmony.org. Now, would uh, a donation to Health and Harmony be a great Christmas gift for people? Hanukkah gift as well for people to give to their friends. Oh yes, please. That would be amazing. <laughs> well, let's do it. Let's raise your twenty million dollars. Oh, I would be delighted. And well, so would the earth, and so would your lungs, and so would <laughs> the very air you breathe at this exact moment. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Kennery Webb, for joining us. Uh, healthandharmony.org, folks, uh, check it out, uh, and please do make a donation. This is really important work. We thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it.